the idea that we are never through studying. Now, you know the passage that comes to mind when you're assigned this subject is study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, handling the right to the word of truth. And the word study there, you know, we think study, well, that word, just that's study. I've got to study. That's how I fulfill that. And, of course, the old translation has it that way. And then, But when we look behind that word in the common English text, we find that the word study means to give diligence. And the concept of giving diligence is a concept that indicates that you're always involved with the spirit of eagerness toward the Bible. Eagerness toward the Word of God. And open God's Word. I realize that there's something tremendous and marvelous and wonderful about that Word. And, and why is that? It's because it is the revelation of the mind of God. The Bible is the revelation of the mind of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9, the Bible says, But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither bent into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them to us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Then he, he makes this illustration so plain and clear. He said, for what man knows the things of a man save the spirit of the man which is in him? Who knows really what's in your head? Who knows what's in your mind? Who knows what's in your heart? You do. You're the only person, even if you've got a wonderful wife like I do and you've got great family and you've got close friends, nobody really knows what's inside you but you. Isn't that right? Nobody knows what you struggle with. Nobody knows the heights or the depths to which your soul and spirit goes. You know that. So he says about that, even so the things of God knows no man but God. So what did God do? We can't know the mind of God until he reveals it to us. The text says, now we have received and Verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that word we there, I take it to mean Paul and the other apostles, inspired individuals. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but with the Holy Spirit teaches Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. See, the reason that we have this continual eagerness, this continual desire, this continual want to be a studying people is because we understand what the Bible says about itself. That it is the mind of God revealed. You know, Paul said that all scripture, you know this one, don't you, is given by inspiration of God as God breathed. All scriptures breathed out by God. It's true. It is truth. Thy word is truth, John chapter 17, verse 17. Now, why do we need this so much? Because this world needs to be turned upside down. This world is sideways. This world is going through a period of dissolution unlike any that it has seen in the last 15, 1600 years. I'm talking about a sense of spiritual dissolution that is presently taking place in our world where the very fabric of society and, and human understanding, relationships that people have with each other, that, that, that this world is crumbling. People say, oh, no, you know, we're making tremendous strides. There are fewer people that are hungry. That's right. Hope that continues. There are fewer people that are thirsty. That's, thirsty. That's right. I hope that continues. But in terms of the spiritual fabric of our world, it's decomposing before our very eyes. Because instead of looking at truth, and some of you have had your apologetics classes and some of the rest of us studied this over the years, instead of looking at truth as direct propositional objective reality, the world has decided that in areas where they want it to be, Truth is subjective. Truth is existential. 
truth is whatever we want it to be at the moment. And, and the driving force behind that attitude in the world that is bringing about the dissolution that we must battle and fight every day, the driving force behind all that is what we can call existential individualism. You know, everybody's an individual. And, and uh, you know, I, ha I live unto myself. Nothing makes any sense except for what I see for me. And, of course, that is a very damaging, uh, very problematic, and it's an attitude toward reality that is fraught with challenge and difficulty. And when I say the world's going through a period of dissolution with regard to that, even in some pagan times, Go back to people like uh, Plato, for example. Even though there's a lot about Plato's philosophy that we would find troublesome, the fact is that he believed in the reality of an idea. The world today has moved away from the reality of the idea, that there's no such thing as an idea that has any reality. Instead, what you think is simply a result of chemical reaction. If you get the chemistry dressed right, you can make a person think anything they want to. Now, you say, well, that's crazy, Bill. No, that's the way it is. That's how people look at uh, matters of thought. You know, fancy word, ratiocination. The, the way people are looking at thought today is no longer that it's, that it's founded in a reality, in an objective reality. But yet we know it is. But we, have to, we have to keep on studying. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Give diligence to manifest thyself approved unto God. Let's look at that passage for a minute. Study. Give diligence. Look past the surface. Dig. Dig. I've got to use an illustration I've used before from this very place. The reason I'm at the Hob Street Church is because of Brother Winfred Clark. I know some of you all know Brother Clark. Brother Clark uh, served as an elder after they brought me in to preach uh, from 90 to 97, at which point in time, of course, he lost his life. I believe one of the last times he ever spoke in public was right here where I'm standing. Brother Clark had a black New Testament. Fellas, Brother Clark had a black New Testament just like this one. And those of you who will remember him, remember him to be a very tall, powerful man. A very tall, powerful man. His son will be here a little bit later today, I believe. And my office was down the hall from where Brother Clark's office was. And from time to time, he would come charging, and I mean charging, down that hall. And he would have his testament like this, and he would be beating on it like that. And he'd get into my office and he'd throw that thing down on my desk, you know. It didn't matter what you were doing. You were doing that right then. And he'd throw that thing down on my desk and he said, Bill, I've been studying the Bible for 55 years and I just saw this today. I just saw this today. Now see that, that's the concept, that's the fiber behind this word Study or give diligence in 2 Timothy 2.15. That's it. That's that eagerness. That's that desire. And if you continue to have that attitude throughout your life as a child of God, you can't help but grow. You'll just keep growing because you'll want to be involved in that work of studying God's Word. Study to show yourself, present yourself, make yourself recognizable as somebody who is interested in the biblical text. Because you want to be approved by God. You want God's approval. I mentioned a moment ago uh, something I th very important to me 
And that's maintaining a sense of humility about our relationship with the Word of God. Humility. Now, you know the mind of Christ, Philippians 2, 5 through 11, the mind of Christ is characterized by humility, obedience, and service. You know that. Humility. What's humility? Well, that's when you don't think too much of yourself. And the thing is, the work that we do as Christians in studying God's Word, you can amass a fair amount of knowledge over long. You know, one of the keys to being knowledgeable is simply staying alive and continuing to work. Isn't that right, Brother David? You've got to stay alive. You've got to keep going. And then if God gave you the ability to study, if God gave you the ability to absorb information from a text like the Bible and you've been given the strength and the time to do that, why wouldn't you be humble about your knowledge of the Word of God? Well, I know. I mean, I know. I know this. I know that. I know this other thing. And nobody's going to tell me. And I've got this down and everything like that. Well, listen. Listen. The great Bible students I've known have all had an attitude of humility toward the text. Every one of them. I remember one time, now some of you, I look at these young guys, and I used to be young too, and some of you got the dark hair and you're still real pretty. Well, one time I was pretty. Now, I remember uh, at the first place I ever preached full-time local work, I was 30 years old, up here at Atwood, Tennessee. Some of you all know where that is in West Tennessee. And we were having, uh, we were, I'd just gotten out of Freed Hardeman, you know, and we were going through some stuff. And I announced to the class that the next book we were going to study was the book of Romans. So we're going to study Romans. And uh, everybody was excited about that. We're going to study Romans. And some of the old fellas in there looked like, I wonder what this guy's going to do. Anyway, the next day we were over at somebody's house. And uh, we'd been there a while. We'd had some social time together, had some good food, something like that. And I told the hostess, I said, well, I've got to go. I've got to go work on my class, my Romans class. And she said, well, didn't you have Romans at Freed Hardeman? I said, well, I did. I did have it down there. Sure did. She said, well, why do you have to study it again? And I said, well, no, it, it doesn't exactly work that way. I said, you have to keep on studying it. Listen, I've, I haven't been studying it as long as Brother Clark was in that illustration. I haven't been studying it as long as some of you have been studying it. But I tell you what, when I look at the book of Romans today, I look at it with a sense of manifest humility. And you sit yourself down and place that psychologically under your pillow at night especially around 7 and 8 and 9. And then you tell me how proud you are of your knowledge of the book of Romans. Fellas, humility is the key. Keep studying. You can know what you know. Knowledge is available. Certain knowledge is available. Absolute knowledge of certain things is available. But absolute certain knowledge of everything is not available to the human mind. But we want to present ourselves approved unto God. Workmen need not be ashamed. Now, approval, what is that? That's behavior that's valued by God. Behavior valued by God. Uh, you know, from time to time, somebody will tell you, you know, I don't care what your job is. If you're bagging groceries, if somebody tells you, man, I sure do appreciate the way you bag. Anybody ever bagged a grocery? You know, a lot of people don't know how to do that. Some of us do. But if, if somebody tells you, boy, you bagged my groceries right, you just go, man, that's good. 
That's good. I had a job when I was a freed hardeman one time. I had a job for a short period of time. Thank the Lord. It was selling ladies' shoes. Now, fellas, if, there's ever an, if you ever have the opportunity not to do that, please take advantage of it. When somebody says, oh, you fit me just right, even then you say, well, I appreciate that. And then when somebody that you respect and you admire tells you you did a good job on that lesson. Now, sometimes folks will tell you that and they're not telling you the truth. You understand that? Sometimes folks say, that was a great lesson. And you've got to ask yourself at that moment, where were they the last 45 minutes? Because they didn't hear what I heard, and I'm the one who said it. Uh, as Brother Clark used to say, you don't hit a home run every time you go to bat. But approval by our friends, as helpful and as important as it is, is nowhere near what this is talking about. Give diligence to show yourself approved unto or by God. And how do we do that? Well, the next section of it talks about a workman. Workman, the word there is Ergerson, you know, somebody who works. Somebody who works. You know, I just had a friend of mine. I'm talking about a good friend at Hobbs Street. We were talking about what we needed to do here, what we needed to do there it's in connection. He said, well, Bill can do that. He only works four hours a week. Well, you know, people, ha, 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 And the fact of the business is, I know where that's coming from. And this particular guy, he and I have a good relationship. And if he wasn't gigging me, there'd be something wrong. If I wasn't gigging him, there'd be something wrong. So... You know, obviously this is not a problem. But the fact of the matter is, if you're going to be a gospel preacher, indeed, if you're going to be a faithful child of God, you're going to work at it. You're going to, you're going to use yourself up in the service of God. Somebody asked you over the years in your ministry, somebody asked you, well, what did you do today? And you said, well, I studied this afternoon. Really? You know, and, and it's like you can see the calculation going across in the mind. Of course, I know if you're a student down in Memphis, you know what it means to study. But in the, in the minds of a lot of people, that means, well, were you, you were sitting in a chair? Well, you sit in a chair for a while, and you stand up, and then you sit back down, and you keep studying. You get another book down, you look up this, and you do this, that, and the other. And people say, is that really work? Oh. I've read a number of studies, uh, particularly related to public speaking, that when you, when, uh, if, you, if you talk about a 30-minute speech, a 30-minute speech, you're talking about exercising yourself, your whole body, including your mind, your nervous system, to the equivalent of eight hours of work. And then you say, oh, I don't believe that. I don't believe it. Well, okay, and that's fine. But the other thing about it is if you're going to be a successful local preacher, if you're going to be a successful teacher at a school, you're going to be successful in working with the Word of God, you're going to find yourself. You know, people say, well, I just work. I just want a 40-hour-a-week job. Well, you need to find something else to do other than be a gospel preacher because you'll never do it in 40 hours. Most weeks you won't do it in 50. Somewhere around 55 or 60 is about average, about right, for the ones that I know, that I follow around, that I have an opportunity to be in the presence of. Listen, if something's easy, it's usually not good. And if something's good, it's usually not easy. And gospel preaching is a blessing. Being a Bible student is a blessing. I know people say, well, listen, I don't have the time. You know, you... You, you're supported by the local church and you, you have time. Exactly, and that's one of the blessings. That's one reason we need to look at this work as a blessing because we're supported to the place that we can spend some time. So when I, I told you about Atwood, I'll tell you one of the blessings I had in my life was when I went to that church, the elders there, you know, Phil Clark and Dan McCormick and E.D. Utley, they told me, they said, Bill, what we want you to do is to make sure that you're in your office 
the first part of the day so that you can study without interruption. He said, small congregation, people not going to bother you. You may have sometimes you got to go sit with a family at surgery or sit with a family at funeral home, but we want you to study at least part of that day, every day. And then I, as I grew and matured as a Christian, as a child of God, I'd read about people like Franklin Camp that got up 4 o'clock in the morning to study. Now, I get up 4 o'clock in the morning because I'm old, but, that, but that's, that has nothing to do. But the thing is, you've got to to block out some time to work on studying God's Word. I was just preparing a lesson today. I was thinking about Deborah. Deborah, a mother in Israel. Remember that? Think about her. If you read that song, the song of Deborah there in in Judges, uh, go back and read that again and see if that doesn't doesn't make you go, hmm. Doesn't make you go, hmm, oh, be a workman. And then not ashamed, not ashamed. What does it mean to be ashamed of something? That need not be ashamed. I tell you what, shame is a tough thing. You ever done something that you're ashamed of? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I've done some things I'm ashamed of. I don't do them like I used to, but I still do some things I'm ashamed of. I think some things that I'm ashamed of. One of these days, I'm going to learn how to drive an automobile without getting agitated. It hadn't happened yet. But you can be ashamed because you haven't done what you were supposed to. I remember one time my daddy told me, he said, Bill, <clears throat> Don't bother that paint in the garage. Well, of course, what did I think about doing? Bothering the paint in the garage. So I went out there and looked one day, and up high on the shelf, there were four cans of paint. And I said, I wonder why he doesn't want me to bother that paint. So I got a ladder, and I went up there, and I opened each top to that paint and I looked at it and it looked just like paint I said I don't see the point and so I put the tops back on the paint and I go down the ladder to get the hammer to tap the tops back on about that time I hear his truck come up the driveway and his truck was a big silver truck that had a colonial store chicken on the side of it because he was a maintenance man for colonial store so i Run in there and I move the ladder. I never do tighten the paint. Forgot all about it. The following weekend, he goes out to look at the paint, and all of a sudden I'm thinking, oh my. He gets that ladder, he puts it in front of the where the paint is, he goes up, and I'm ashamed. I'm what this word says right here. Because he takes that first can of paint. He didn't have but one Sunday pair of pants. He didn't wear them to church. I don't know why he had them anyway. But anyway, he took that can of paint and he did like this to see what he'd written on the top. We want to be approved by God, not ashamed in the presence of God. And I was ashamed in his presence, and believe me, I paid for that little problem. Then we have this expression. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Handling aright the word of truth. Rightly dividing. Where does that word come from? Well, it's a word that just simply means to make a straight cut. That's why it says rightly dividing. That's why the old translation used that dividing thing. And then later on they came to the conclusion that what he's talking about there is proper handling and when you think about what was what was Paul's applic what was his job I mean we know that he was trained as a as a rabbi he was in that training whether he had made it to wherever he was going to go in terms of his studies with Gamaliel or not I don't know I just know he sat at the feet of Gamaliel but like most Jewish boys, he, he wasn't just a professional man. He also had a craft. He had a way to do something with his hands, which is, by the way, a pretty good idea to be able to drive a truck or do something, teach school, do something. If you're going to preach, be able to have some backup 
plan. Well, what was his? Tent maker. What do you do when you make a tent? You cut fabric. And when you cut that fabric, you want to make sure that you cut it. You take a piece of fabric. You want to be just like when this carpet was put down. The carpet layers cut the carpet so as to maximize the practical use of the fabric that they had. So when Paul talks about handling aright the word of truth or rightly dividing the word of truth, he says, use it properly. Be careful with it. You know, now we've, over the years, we've looked at this rightly dividing and what's the first thing that we'll say to people sometimes? Well, we'll say there's a patriarchal dispensation, there's a mosaic dispensation, and there's a Christian dispensation. Well, all that's true. But that may not be exactly what he has in mind right here. What he's talking about is handling the Word of God in a proper way. Handle it carefully. And to me, what he's talking about here. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman need not be ashamed. Handling a right or rightly dividing the word of truth. When we, when we are presented with the passage in God's word to study, we need to think, how, what can I do to enhance my comprehension of this passage? It's talking about enhancing comprehension of the passage. I want to understand as much as I can of what the passage says in order that I may be able to communicate what I've comprehended to other people. And comprehension comes from a number of things. Context. I mean, that's what they're teaching you, I know. You've got to understand the context. Who's writing? And who's being written to? I, I have a little symbol that I put beside sometimes. I'll write the word who. And then an arrow that's got both ends on it. Who's, who's writing this and who's receiving this? It does me no good whatsoever to read a passage in God's book and not know who wrote it. it does nobody any good. You know, somebody quote the 23rd Psalm, tell me who wrote that. So, well, uh, you know, then finally you think, well, it's David, his shepherd boy. Really? You sure? I know it's David, but are you sure that he wrote it when he was a boy? Or maybe he wrote part of it when he was a boy, or maybe he wrote it when he was a boy and then he changed it over the years as he became the great king. You know, does that change the understanding of the passage to think about David before he battles Goliath or David before he spares Saul's life twice or David before he sins with Bathsheba? Does that change anything? Slightly. So not only do we ask ourselves who wrote it, but when was it written? A lot turns on those questions. Hence his comprehension where was it written? What part of the world were these things written in? And why was it written? If, if the Bible tells you why, uh, many other signs truly to Jesus in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that when you read them, you may understand, believe, have eternal life, John 20, 30, and 31. When the Bible tells you why something is written, ah. Oh. Book of Revelation. Oh, boy, that's a kettle of worms, isn't that? Is it kettle of worms or can of worms? I don't know. In fact, kettle of worms would be entirely too many worms. But say it's a can of worm, but the point is, if you look at the book of Revelation, there's one thing you can know about it. John says these things must shortly come to pass. It was written in order to benefit the people who read it in the first century. So what does it mean to handle right or right or divide? It means to conduct oneself interaction with the Word of God in such a fashion to enhance comprehension. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, Blessed 
are they which do and excuse me, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Do we thirst for the word of God? Do we thirst for this word? Do we desire fervently to be students of God's book? My dear friends, I believe a Christian should never be more than arm's length away from a copy of this book. And if you can't have it with you, have it with you. You understand what I'm saying? 